So, um, unfortunately, as you saw, our Japanese colleagues uh, have been unable to attend. Um, so despite some really excellent uh, abstracts submitted and accepted from that, that group of people, uh, we were unable to present them. However, that got us back on time. Uh, so there is a silver lining to that cloud. It's now the privilege of Dr. Taggart and myself uh, to present our second uh, 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award. And this is a tradition of the International Corning Congress. Uh, we're actually very much honored to also have in the room Dr. Bruce Lytle, who was the first recipient uh, of the International uh, Corning Congress Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015, along with his friend and colleague Brian Buxton from Australia. In 16, Naresh Trehan, uh, who um, has built an empire in India um, on high quality coronary surgery. Uh, Dr. Green uh, was the first American to perform an IT anastomosis. And interestingly, I presently have the job that he had in 1968. Uh, so when I was eight years old, he held the job that I have now. Dr. Hu runs the largest uh, coronary program on the planet at Fu Wai Hospital uh, in Beijing. Uh, and last year, Antonio Calafiore, in 19, Calif Antonio Calafiore was honored for his many contributions to coronary surgery. Last year, we honored uh, Paul Sargent, an extraordinary uh, surgical educator, and Michael Mack, one of the earliest mid-cab uh, surgeons. This year, we're going to honor a gentleman named Thomas Salerno. Uh, in, in addition to Kibong Kim, who we recognized uh, uh, on uh, Friday, uh, Dr. Salerno was born in a small town in Brazil to a modest family. He worked during the day and went to school at night in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He was awarded a scholarship to, a, to study at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, after graduating from this high school in Sao Paulo. At McGill, he distinguished himself as a scholar, earning a bachelor's degree with honors in biochemistry, and then a medical school degree, uh, and indeed a master's degree in experimental surgery, all from McGill. And it was here that he met the man who performed the world's first surgical myocardial revascularization procedure. I'm going to show this slide, which is a little bit of a diversion from uh, honoring Dr. Salerno, but it honors our history uh, as an international organization uh, and an international effort uh, for coronary surgery because Alexis Carell, the Frenchman who earned the Nobel Prize for the vascular anastomosis, was the first to, concept, to describe the concept of operating the coronary arteries and actually did so in dogs. Arthur Weinberg uh, from Montreal uh, implanted, created the Weinberg procedure and implanted the mammary artery directly into the uh, anterior wall of the left ventricle and Dr. Vasily Kolosov from Russia, then known as the Soviet Union, uh, performed the first clinically successful coronary bypass in 1959, before most of us in this room were born. The Weinberg procedure was the beginning, uh, and you see on the right-hand side uh, some late angiograms of Weinberg-implanted mammaries into the anterior wall of the left ventricle with perfusion to the ischemic myocardium. Thomas Salerno is, I believe, the only person I've ever met who's operated uh, with uh, Dr. Weinberg. And typical of Dr. Salerno, he managed to convince Dr. Weinberg that even as a medical student, he was worthy of that honor and scrubbed with him uh, on a Weinberg procedure. So here he is in 1970 with uh, the great Professor Weinberg. Dr. Uh, Salerno um, began, uh, well, finished his uh, internship and residency at the Royal Victoria Hospital in McGill. He began his surgical practice in Kingston, Ontario. Um, he returned to McGill University as associate professor and subsequently was recruited to be chief of cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Toronto, arguably the premier academic cardiothoracic surgical post in Canada. He later moved to SUNY Buffalo as chief of cardiothoracic surgery, where he promoted off-pump coronary bypass surgery via, le via lectureships and international video conferences. Indeed, it was in 1996 Dr. Salerno allowed me to visit him in Buffalo to observe off-pump bypass. I was chief resident in cardiothoracic surgery at Emory at the time. And while Tom does not recognize or remember my visit, it left an indelible impression on me. It's okay. Um, I will never forget watching beating heart surgery for the first time. 
It was remarkable, even when performed with the makeshift crude instruments available at the time. So I owe Dr. Salerno a personal debt of gratitude for his teaching and mentorship. Dr. Salerno then relocated to the University of Miami, where he is currently tenured professor in surgery and holds a position as chief emeritus. He has dedicated his life to academic surgery uh, and has published more than 500 peer-reviewed papers with an exceptionally high H impact factor. Now, Tom has also benefited from the mentorship and partnership of other people as he's helped to advance the field. Here he is with Federico Benetti and Inio Buffalo, two other South American uh, pioneers in coronary surgery, and Ricardo Lima as well. Dr. Salerno has edited 10 books, contributed chapters to almost 50 other books, and has been a pioneer in multiple areas of adult cardiac surgery, making seminal contributions to the fields of myocardial protection through cardioplegia, optimal conduct of cardiopulmonary bypass, including warm heart surgery, and off-pump bypass, uh, in which he was one of the earliest pioneers. He currently serves as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cardiac Surgery, a prestigious journal in our field, and continues to contribute to our profession and to the field of coronary surgery. Indeed, he will be publishing in the Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery all the abstracts uh, presented here at our meeting. Uh, and uh, we anticipate a special edition uh, that may include uh, some of the uh, invited lectures as well. It is my personal pleasure to award Dr. Thomas A. Salerno the International Corning Congress Lifetime Achievement Award for 2021. Dr. Salerno. I'm uh, humbled by this introduction. I consider myself actually a messenger of the pioneers of the past. And you can see here in front of you pioneers of the future, some in the audience, most of you, and our leaders in the current field. I was sitting here thinking the specialty has changed tremendously from the days that I began. I'm going to tell a very short story about that. And I'm, it's, it is my strong belief that every single cardiac surgeon practicing coronary artery disease should attend this meeting. I think the specialty has changed. I was sitting here thinking, how can a resident or a regular surgeon practicing today practice the state of cardiac surgery as we saw in this conference? Now, how do I advance the slides here? I push a button. So, uh, Uh, yeah. John simplified my presentation. <laughs> I'm grateful to him, to David, and Mario. Those are all personal friends, and um, I owe them quite a bit in my career, uh, and I have followed their careers. They already mentioned where I came from for a very modest family. Um, my father was a humble man with my mom, but both passed. I went to school, as they mentioned, in the place. One of the aspects of this is I came to the United States to teach Peace Corps volunteers in Brattleboro, Vermont. And when I was there for six months, I decided I'm going to stay in this country. And I bought a pocketbook scholarship for foreigners. And all of them said no, except one which made my love for New York with the Leopold Schaap Foundation. They invited me for an interview. They said if I got in any, any school, they would give me the scholarship, I got into McGill, I come back, they said, the scholarship is for Americans, it's not for Brazilians. Well, the world fell apart because I couldn't afford to go to school. It occurred to me that I am American, but South American. So I got that scholarship from Leopold Schem Foundation to go to McGill, and they supported me throughout my medical school. I went through internship, all at the Royal Victoria Hospital, and got a, a general surgery, a master's degree, cardiothoracic surgery, 
life seemed to go on forever as a, as a student. But the important part of all this, the people that inspired me in my career, Dr. Dobell was my program director. Weinberg was already mentioned, and I have a, the real punch of today's presentation here is my encounter with Weinberg, because uh, uh, they were, I was a medical student, a second year medical student, rotating through cardiac surgery, and the chief residence, Jonathan Meekins Jr., uh, would not like to scrub with Dr. Weinberg because his operations take 18 hours. <laughs> well, as a medical student, I wanted to be in the operating room, so I loved staying there doing nothing for 18 hours and watching him making this tunnel in the heart and, and doing the Weinberg operation. He got to know him very well because I, I, they favored to ask me to scrub with him, uh, and I was actually one of the few who could mobilize his patients. His patient after surgery would stay in bed, lie down, intubate, ventilate it without moving for four days. And to remove chest tube was a big production, and only he and I could do it at the end of my meetings with him. But the only proof I have of what I'm gonna to describe to you is in a textbook, two, 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 uh, vo two volumes of books that he gave me. The background for this is Weinberg was doing an operation in a lady from Venezuela, and he made the tunnel and the heart fibrillated. He screamed, too much blood, too much blood, and take the mammary artery out, and now we have this huge hematoma on the surface of the heart, ligated the mammary, closed the chest. He confided on me that this patient was going to die. I said, no, it's not gonna die, I'll take care of this patient. Well, the patient lived, and he promised me this book, but the book was very expensive. I went after him, and he gave me the book. Now, here's the proof. It's not what it says, it's just I want to tell you that he gave me the book. And the book says to my friend and confrere, he thinks I'm a confrere of his, um, a man of purpose and great ability with love for humanity, Tom Salerno not of Weinberg. Well, I, I didn't realize what this is all about, and then I opened the second volume. And the second, second volume is what is most surprising. He writes to Tom Salerno, one of the best residents I have ever had the pleasure to work with. Well, I told one of my colleagues that I got this book. This colleague goes and tells Dr. Weinberg, I was not a resident, I was a medical student. <laughs> he said, you lied to me all these years. I said, I lie nothing, you never asked me. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's actually, I mean, this is the only proof that I have that the story I'm telling is the truth. And Weinberg told me the secret of longevity. I'm going to tell you here right now. I was meeting with Weinberg. He, he lived a long time. We became very close. One day I asked him, what is the secret for longevity? He said, Tom, God gave you a certain number of heartbeats. You want to get there fast? You jog. You want to get slow? You walk. So ever since then, I walk. I don't want to get there fast. Um, the, the story of coronary surgery, as you all know, uh, Favaloro, uh, a quarter of a century ago, or, or half a century ago, uh, de described this operation. Uh, uh, after he, they did quite a bit of Weinberg operation. This operation is still done the same way by a lot of cardiac surgeons all over the world. Um, it's, a, it's gained popularity, and many people have contributed to this. Uh, Floyd Loop, uh, um, Bruce Light was in the audience here, and, and the pioneers, uh, which are, as was mentioned before. Benetti invited invite me to Argentina to give a talk in the 80s, and I saw him doing a mid cab to a small toracot without any instrument, so we became very close friends. Simultaneously, a new Buffalo was doing off pump. And in a meeting in, so in Sao Paulo, I made the statement, the day I find a way of doing the circumflex, the heart-lung machine is over. And a guy in the audience by the name of Ricardo Lima, Dr. Salerno, can I show you something? He showed me the Lima suture. That day, the heart-lung machine died, in my opinion. I haven't used the heart-lung machine in coronary artery surgery for over 30 years. Very few cases do I ever use the heart-lung machine. I'm not suggesting you should do it. I saw the pros and cons. I have decided this operation does not require the heart-lung machine. In a meeting in Rome that, that the Posati organized, 
Benetti showed his idea about Lima 2 DLAD through toracoscope, as shown here, which is not, it was not a new concept for him. And together with Calafiori uh, and Guido Sani, they went to Chieti, where Calafiori and Benetti did what's called the last operation, left anterior small toracotomy. Uh, this has evolved into the hybrid. It was mentioned here today, the hybrid approach. In 1996, Angeline and our group, and the group, I was part of it, did the first hybrid procedure in the cath lab shown here. Unfortunately, the second patient we did had received Flavix and bled. And so therefore, we lost the interest on this operation, but it was published in 1996, and it may be revived. Meanwhile, in Buffalo, Jacob Bergsland, a colleague of mine, and he and I were developing the first minimally invasive cardiac surgical program in the country. We really went through a small incision. This minimally invasive is a misnomer. It's not minimally invasive. It's a cosmetic small incision. Invasiveness, the definition by Calafiori and Salerno, invasiveness is the use of the heart-lung machine. The size of the incision doesn't matter. Invasiveness equals the use of the heart-lung machine. I was very fortunate to meet my, my friend Omar Latouf in here. You can see we organize a lot of seminars and conferences in Atlanta. Every, he included everybody, his perfusion, Karim, the administration. Uh, Gerald Buckberg and I were present at that meeting, and together with Omar, we went all over the world talking about off-pump. Gerald Buckberg, who's deceased, and I had the Tom and Jerry show. I mean, everybody thought we're enemies, we're the best friends. What I did, I used Gerald to promote my off-pump in my operation, talk about myocardial protection. So there's a transition in my, in my life in coronary artery surgery from what you've seen here today, terminating in robotic. Meanwhile, as you know, coronary artery surgery has been threatened by the development of stents and geoplasty. And for a while, we were kind of depressed, except that there was restenosis forming, and then comes the rapamycin stent, who even threatened more uh, with the new generation cardiac surgery. Well, cardiac surgeons in my time were told that within a decade, we would become dinosaur, we'll be extinct. Well, they did not know that we're survivors. We've been here for 400 million years, and we're surviving and thriving. And I think coming to this meeting has inspired me to hear and to see that there is a tremendous future for the advancement of our specialty. But we need to change, perhaps, our mind. We know that coronary artery surgery is alive and well. There is no doubt it's the most effective treatment of coronary artery disease. It has evolved into complete arterial vascularization. Some of the pioneers are here who have developed that and will continue to thrive in the years to come. The, sur the surgery was presented by world leaders in this meeting, as I've seen here, with focus of super specialization. I'm beginning to think for a while, and I'm beginning to be a few believer now, that this procedure requires further training. If thoracic surgery requires additional surgery training, this is more difficult than thoracic surgery. And it's hard for me to believe that any average residency training uh, trainees or surgeon can do uh, this operation without further training. But one of the things that impressed me most here, if you don't measure flows during cabbage, you do not know what you did. You need to measure flows. As a matter of fact, I shouldn't say this to you. As the editor of the journal, any papers that talk about flows, that did not measure flows during the operation but did follow up, I'm not interested. Because the, the failure may be related to the, to the, to the, the grass being occluded. Uh, we already saw about the robotic approach, Gianluca, uh, Balcom, and others, and including my colleague here, Pushka. There is no doubt that the future is this. As a matter of fact, what, one of the meetings uh, one of the Saturday mornings coffee session that Gianluca organized, one surgeon says cardiac surgery is robotic surgery. Redo, valve, whatever is robotic surgery. I'm very fortunate to have a great family, my son, my daughter, the granddaughters, uh, Tamara and Riley, and my wife who's present here. My wife has been with me for all these years, supported me through all these years, put up with a lot of idiosyncrasies in my part. Uh, we share, she shares her life with me, and for this I'm eternally grateful. I'm very, very grateful for her to be here to witness this. Now, I'm going to give you the final perspective where coronary artery surgery is. It will continue to evolve. I want to show this. 
Think about the, this, what I'm going to show you has a 115 year history. Here we start with the first airplane, 1906. Who would ever think that would become this? Think about coronary surgery when it first started and what you just heard over here. This machine flies almost over half the world with 400 people without stopping and it goes supersonic. There is a history on the, on the next one. I'm sorry, unfortunately it will not play. And now we're going to space. And the cardiac surgeon sitting in the console manipulating cabbage vessels, and someone is sitting in the console flying a helicopter in another planet. This occurred in 115 years, and I think as a group, and with the leading that we have in front of us here, we need to look at cardiac surgery in this manner. Where are we going to lead this, this um, specialty in into the future? It is our responsibility to do that. So, having said all this, and sitting here, I can tell you one thing that I regret. I wish I were born today to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we, 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 uh, as I mentioned, uh, when Kibong King w Kim was here on the podium uh, uh, on Friday, we had some supply chain challenges. Your Tiffany engraved uh, crystal heart will arrive uh, in not the too distant future. So this concludes uh, our session this morning. I think we have a coffee break now, and then we will resume shortly. Well done,